So just to kind of give you a schema for what we'll cover today, um, we're going to be talking about possible long-term complications. I've tried to color code a little bit of the slides so that you'll see in the in sort of bright blue, that's sort of what the recommended screenings are. Um, and in the green are things that you can do to try to reduce complications and what are some management strategies. So you'll kind of see that theme as we go along in the long and the blue and the green. We'll also at the end talk about a really important topic and that's transitioning to adult providers. Um, and what you should know is that really all these recommendations are based on the 2016 Children's Oncology Group um, survivorship plan. And so even though that is an oncology group, which means cancer, this is also meant to apply to uh, children who've had transplants for non-malignant diseases as well, because it's really supposed to be uh, tailored toward the transplant time. However, if your child had a transplant for a non-malignant disease, there are emerging recommendations for disease-specific areas, and that's something to watch out for. A lot of them have been coming out in the last year, but today we're going to focus on the, the general COG recommendations. Um, you may already be familiar with, but just so you know, TBI stands for total body irradiation. It may already be familiar to you, but just in case, we've abbreviated that on the slides. And then today, we're not going to touch really on um, school issues and learning issues or uh, fertility. Um, those are things that are going to be covered in very specific sessions later, so I direct you towards those. All right. All right, so we'll get started. So growth is often at the forefront, of course, as we're dealing with uh, younger patients. And the reality is, is that the majority of post-transplant patients are going to experience some issue related to growth. Um, a lot of this has to do uh, with your age at the time of transplant. If you're older and have already completed your growth, it's obviously less of an issue versus the young you, young you are at the time of transplant. And it really is a very complex interaction that doesn't just involve growth hormone, but lots of other hormones. Um, and so the recommendations, of course, are that you look at height, weight, um, and then body mass index, which takes account into how your weight is related to your height. Um, and then tanner staging. Tanner staging is a way to look at your puberty development, and that is very helpful to follow along to know if you're making progressions at the right time. And so those are all things that should be done at least every six months. Um, a lot that's really important to understand is what's the, what's the family's overall growth pattern. So if you have two parents who are both on the shorter end of the scale, that child is automatically, even without transplant, going to be on the shorter end of the scale. So a lot of it is important to understand what the parents' heights are, what would be your normal expectation, and trying to understand related to that. So it's important to see the child's growth curves before transplant and then follow them along because many times it's not just the absolute value, the measurement today, it's what's the change over time. So you might hear people call that growth velocity, and so it's meaning how fast, and at certain times as we get closer to hopefully puberty, you're going to want to see that velocity kind of kick in. So it's really understanding the changes over time. Um, if there's poor growth, there are a lot of number of things you can do. Thyroid, 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 it's such an easy thing to fix if you have a low thyroid, um, and it's so common after transplant. Very easy to check, and that's something that should be monitored frequently. And then also there's something called bone age, which is done by doing an x-ray of the hand, and then the radiologists do a very detailed analysis, and they age it out based on, on these established norms. And that can be very helpful in understanding, well, how much more growth potential is left? Because if you have a patient who is 9 or 10 years old, but their bone age is much more advanced, then your window is sort of closing for growth. And so that's an easy test to do and it's important and you can kind of put in context with everything else. Um, certainly it's a good idea to be seen by an endocrinologist and I think most of us have a really low threshold. If there's any question at all, you're going to get the endocrinologist involved and it's worth seeing them. Even at the end of the day, if they don't recommend hormone supplementation or change, it's just good to have that input because you have that opportunity for intervention potentially and you want to look into it. Um, Anybody who's had 30 gray of cranial radiation or higher should automatically go to an endocrinologist because we know at those levels you're kind of affecting the command centers um, in the brain for all the hormone levels, and so that would be an automatic referral. But uh, many, many patients end up seeing an endocrinologist. So very often the issue of growth hormone comes up, and it's a very tricky one. Um, the endocrinologist can help do growth hormone testing. They can help look at the levels. They can do stimulation tests to see if there's um, even a response. But sometimes this is tricky. If your child has received total body radiation 
it's not just a hormone problem, but the bones themselves have received the radiation. So that can be the issue if they were younger and those growth plates and the bones were exposed to radiation, even with extra hormone, you may not really be able to impact that. So it's something you really have to factor in. And I will tell you, this is probably one of the hardest areas. Um, there's no, there's not really a clear cut of these kids should get growth hormone, these kids shouldn't. And so it really is an ongoing uh, conversation. Uh, many patients uh, and parents are very nervous about growth hormone. Um, there does not seem to be an increase in the original cancer if you were transplanted for a cancer, but there is a small uh, increased risk of a second type of cancer during the early part. And so for, again, most families, by the time you've gone through a transplant, these kind of hearing these sorts of things is very nerve-wracking. And so I think you really have to sit down and kind of think about, plot out what the growth is, what you're expecting, and is this uh, something that you're willing to do. So this is a, probably one of the toughest areas, honestly, that, that we deal with. So thyroid disease, I already kind of mentioned this. This is really just so common. Um, any, anybody with a history of total body radiation, they're almost guaranteed at some point in time to become hypothyroid. Or even if you didn't get total body radiation, but perhaps you're a Hodgkin's patient or some other lymphoma patient who did get some uh, neck area radiation, really important to check this. But to be honest, we see this even in patients who didn't receive radiation, say they perhaps received a busulfan-based um, regimen. So it is important to monitor um, and to have a different threshold. So sometimes as you're checking these patients, you'll see that they're not technically abnormal, but they're heading, you're seeing changes over time in these levels. And, and many times we will go ahead and refer them to the endocrinologist because you sort of know it's coming and you're trying to stay on, on top of it. So sometimes it's even important to know the patient's history and make sure the endocrinologist knows that and interpreting the labs um, because it's different than just someone who's gonna walk in off the street. Um, should also get an annual exam. The thyroid gland sort of sits here in the neck, um, and that should be palpated or felt each year to look for any nodules or abnormalities. Some centers do um, follow with a thyroid ultrasound, um, often starting at, say, five to ten years after radiation. That is, that is not necessarily standard. It still is a little bit controversial. You typically do pick up things when you do an ultrasound, but many of them end up being benign. And so people are trying to understand more. Is it worth doing the ultrasound? Are we picking up things that don't matter anyway? Or are we truly picking up things that would allow us to make a difference? And so that tends a little bit to be um, center specific. So talk to your physician. So bone health. Um, this is a, a common issue. We're all just in general hearing a lot more about bone health. Um, in particular, what we're talking about is having a risk of lower bone density. So the bone's not being as strong, more likely to fracture. And then in particular, something called avascular necrosis. Um, and that is a tough problem. That's usually related to steroids. And so in particular, um, our ALL patients who've often already had tons of steroids even before transplant, or patients who've had a, a tough history of GVHD who get a lot of steroid exposure, those are the folks that we often see most with this problem. Um, in particular, teenagers seem to be more susceptible to the steroid effects, um, so that's something to keep an eye on. So patients who were diagnosed younger, um, Caucasian patients, GVHD treatment, which is really steroid exposure, lower weight, those are all potential risks for, for avascular necrosis and, uh, and some bone health problems. Um, so you should have a bone density test or a DEXA, scan, which is a pretty easy test um, to have done, at least once, so one year after BMT. If it looks good at that point, um, you can usually sort of stop doing that for monitoring, but you want to have one of those at least at least once um, within the first year after transplant. This is often important. The AVN can creep up on you, so if there's pain in hips, hips are the most common area, hips and knees, even shoulders, it kind of seems out of proportion um, that's not responding. It's a good time to sit back and think about, could this be AVN? Um, usually it has to be diagnosed based on an MRI. Most insurance companies won't approve an MRI, and so you do a plain X-ray, which is frustrating, but you usually have to start with an X-ray. But if the X-ray is negative, that doesn't mean you don't have AVN. And so the pain is there. You really should follow up with an MRI. Um, and then usually we can have folks go on and see an orthopedic specialist. 
Um, there's all sorts of levels of AVN, um, and it's very controversial if some of the interventions help. Um, some orthopedists do something called a core decompression. There's certainly patients who've had benefit from that. It, it's just it's not an entirely clear area, so it's good to go talk to an orthopedist. There certainly are patients that unfortunately have to go on to joint replacement, um, and that's really a balance, too, because most orthopedists are not used to thinking about joint replacements in young folks, and they're often hesitant. Um, and we understand that because the joints are only going to last a certain period of time. But for many patients, they can be so riddled by pain and really not functional that it can be life-changing to get a joint replacement, even at a young age. And I think they really have to, you can have your um, survivorship doctor kind of help help uh, advocate for you there. But it can really be life-changing to get a lot of people more functional. Vitamin D and calcium levels, those are very easy things to do. And we're now understanding that vitamin D probably has a whole lot more impact on your health than just bone health. And so there are lots and lots of reasons. It's sometimes an easy thing to forget to take because lots of people need the supplement and think it's a vitamin. But honestly, it's really important. We are seeing that vitamin D is starting to affect almost all the organ systems. So that's important to monitor and an easy thing to fix. Um, and definitely if you're seeing abnormalities on the DEXA scan, people are going to refer you on to an endocrinologist and they can kind of consider some other interventions after that. Um, but definitely encouraging regular physical activity can help build um, bone mass and for lots of reasons trying to be as active as possible with weight-bearing exercise is important, although that can be tricky if you have AVN and so that's where you really have to work with a physical therapist and, and find some good options. So eyes and ears are super important things. Um, and here what we're really talking about primarily are cataracts. Um, and the nice thing is, is that it's actually an easy problem to fix. I always tell my patients it's just like grandpa's cataracts. It's an easy surgery. It's an easy fix. But it's important to be monitored for that. Um, and so that usually is related to patients who receive total body irradiation. Um, and particularly they've also had extracranial radiation. But the majority of patients, if you've had TBI, at some point in time you're going to have cataracts. It's just a matter of when. And so you want to make sure you have a, a good exam. Patients who receive busulfan also can have cataracts. And, of course, steroids come back again um, as a risk factor. The other issue that can come up is that patients with chronic TBHD can have dry eye syndromes. And the ophthalmologists can be great partners here. There's lots of new therapies, lots of different kinds of drops, special lenses, a lot that can be done here um, to help with, with dry eye. Um, and a lot of times, depending on where you are located to your transplant center, you may live far away, maybe trying to coordinate some of this care closer to home, and that's fine. I think the important thing here, though, is that uh, most transplant physicians and survivorship doctors would like you to see an ophthalmologist, which is different than an optometrist, because it's not just about do you need glasses and vision, but we want that good exam at the back of the eye, and the ophthalmologists are just going to have more experience with patients who've had a complicated medical history. Um, and um, we've had a number of kids with ophthalmologists that picked up things that weren't, weren't even related to transplants, but we were able to intervene early. Um, so this is an important exam. So for hearing, um, this is usually related to platinum exposure, so carboplatin or cisplatin. So this is typically our neuroblastoma patients or brain tumor patients. Um, and so we would like to have a complete hearing exam the first year after transplant. If things look good, you can then kind of decide from there how much longer you'd like to monitor. If you pick up some issues, then you can do ongoing annual monitoring. Um, and then, of course, again, our patients who receive high doses of cranial radiation, that affects the, the nerves that are related for hearing, and they're going to have very special um, evaluations. All right, dental. Uh, Yes, I think many parents of, of survivors will know that um, they have lots and lots of dental visits. Um, this is something, and I, you know, it's, I think important to understand that it, a lot has to do with the age at time of exposure. This brushing and all those things are super important, but there's so many things that happen that are independent of this, so it's not uncommon for our transplant patients to end up being a lot of dental work down the road. Okay, and particularly it has to do with the time at transplant, so the younger kids. The, the toddlers that transplant, they will often end up having a lot of dental work done, in particular neuroblastoma patients. Um, we seem to see this a lot for them, certainly patients who, who get TBI. Um, and 
they can often end up with actually missing teeth, um, changes in the enamel, changes in the roots. And so this is ideal really to have a pediatric dentist. Um, sometimes that may or may not be possible in your location. But I will tell you the changes are so different that the pediatric dentist is going to be used to dealing with that. If you're fortunate enough that your transplant center also has a dental school for, um, per se, that is terrific because then they can actually, you know, because many of the kids need sedated dental work, they can coordinate with your transplant team for anything special that needs to happen, and they will really understand what these kids need. So uh, certainly a pediatric dentist if you can. If you've got one at your transplant center, that's even better. Um, so all the basic stuff, you know, cleanings every six months and, um, and the oral exams, but they often will do a, an X-ray um, called a Panorex just to get a look and see. They can see what's underneath, what you can't see emerging yet, and see where problems might be. Um, so a very important area that we often don't think about so much and talk about so much before transplant, but it's definitely a, um, something that, that later on becomes super important. All right, lungs. Um, so some of the risk factors related to lungs are patients who have received bleomycin. So this is often our lymphoma patients um, or some of the patients with solid tumors um, who go on to an autologous transplant. Busulfan um, and uh, also BCNU, uh, which is used in lymphoma patients. And then, of course, chest radiation. So many times our lymphoma patients get a triple whammy here. They've had the bleomycin exposure, BCNU, also chest radiation, so those are often patients followed most closely. And then chronic GVHD, I think all of us have come to, oh, we just, we hate chronic GVHD, the lungs, um, but an important thing to, to follow with. And so we recommend doing the pulmonary function test um, one year after transplant, and most centers will even be following during that first year, or trying to catch on early to any changes. But at least that first year after transplant and then after that each year, screening for symptoms and if you're concerned, doing the PFTs. The tricky thing can be is that most kids have to be at least six and sometimes a little bit older to be able to do this. It is very effort dependent and that's important to know. Um, I'm fortunate that my techs will let me know if they felt like somebody you know, had good effort or not good effort and, and great techs will learn how to coach these kids and, and get them excited about doing the testing because it is effort dependent and you don't want to make changes or interventions without good valid test results. Um, so that, that is an important thing to do. And what's often hard is that many of our kids were young enough, they couldn't do it before transplant, so we don't have a pre-transplant thing to compare to. It's something we're kind of catching, catching up on later. Um, but I think one of the most important things we can talk to the kids about um, is cigarette exposure. Um, absolutely not, ever, ever, ever. Um, and then now, unfortunately, that we're seeing the resurgence of these other issues, the vaping and the e-cigs, talking to them, letting them know that the, those have just as many problems, really important for these kids not to be around those exposures and not to ever, ever pick them up. Heart. All right, well, this is often becomes sort of a double whammy, often for our leukemia patients, so particularly our AML patients who tend to have a lot of exposure to certain chemotherapy before transplant. So you might hear your um, team talk about anthracyclines, and anthracyclines are just a class of chemotherapy drugs. Um, many of them tend to be sort of orangish reddish, so some of those parents will remember those hanging. One of them, mitosantrum, is sort of a sea blue, so you kind of notice them, might remember them. Um, but they can be hard on the, on the heart, and so in particular, leukemia patients, especially AML, get a lot of exposure even before the transplant process starts. Um, the effects of those we know are highest on girls who are under the age of five at the time of exposure, so that plays into it as well. Um, of course, if you've gotten chest radiation, and the radiation oncologist can usually tell us how much exposure um, has been given to the heart. And the good thing is, is it's so much more advanced the way they deliver radiation these days. Um, and when they're just doing regular chest radiation, they will try, of course, to avoid the heart as much as possible. They can tell us the dose. Of course, TBI, there is a dose there. Um, and so it's important to have an idea and know what the exposure was. And then for the anthracycline chemotherapy, it's really important to know what the dose was. We calculate these in milligrams per meter squared um, added over time. And we'll talk about at the end about survivorship care plans. And hopefully you, you'll have one of those and have that written down because that is important. Knowing your child's age at the time of exposure, their sex, and how much they got really helps guide what the monitoring schedule is and what their risk is. 
So the echoes are done anywhere from annually up to every five years, depending on what the level of exposure was. Um, it's definitely an area we're learning a lot about, and many times we're starting to see some changes. Refer those patients to cardiologists, and they're beginning to start to use some blood pressure medicines, really not, not so much for blood pressure control, but there are certain medications that seem to perhaps be protective. So if we start to see some changes, it's a good idea to see the cardiologist, and, and many cardiologists will start them on the medicines. All right, kidney. The kidneys kind of get it from all directions. Um, and many, many of the medicines throughout therapy are just tough on the kidneys. Um, some patients will have radiation exposure, whether it's from TBI or perhaps they got had a tumor in that area and had extra exposure. And so blood pressure is certainly something that needs to be screened every year. Um, and then also checking out the urine. So is there protein in the urine? Um, and that can many times be a sign that we need to work something up further. Also looking at electrolytes, particular calcium, magnesium, and phosphorus. The kidneys normally know how to hang on to those. As you eat and drink and do your things, the kidneys know what to sort of hang on to, and they know what to let go of. But many times um, the insult they get from some of the medications, um, they, they sort of lose that ability. And so the, the kidneys will keep flushing out more than, than they should. And so some patients will end up with pretty low levels of magnesium or phosphorus or calcium, and we have to supplement those. Um, so that's something to keep a close eye on. Um, and if there's any concern that the blood pressure is, is worsening, protein in the urine, um, we definitely like to send patients on to see a kidney doctor, um, which is a nephrologist. And it's important sometimes as you're looking at creatinine, which is that on your lab work and just that measurement of if kidney function is for kids, many times it won't be abnormal in the system because there's such a huge range. So it's really important to understand what the child's baseline is and also how that fits in relation to their body size. Creatinine is in muscle, and so, you know, sometimes we'll see these, these creatinines and look at a sweet little scrawny child and go, well, there's no way, even though it's marked as normal, mm, they don't have that kind of muscle mass. And so it is important not to just look at the value itself for creatinine, but to really interpret it for the child. Have they changed over time, and, and how does that make sense in relation to their, to their body mass? All right, so GI tract. So the biggest risk factors here are, are GBHD, um, can affect the gut, veno-occlusive disease, which is also called sinusoidal obstruction syndrome, um, and then radiation. And so all patients should have some screening tests for their liver. Um, most parents are used to kind of hearing about bilirubins and, and liver function tests. Um, and then also ferritin. Ferritin is not some, something we talk about so much during treatment, but ferritin is a way to try to look at iron overload in the body. Um, it's an imperfect measurement um, because it also responds to inflammation, um, so sometimes it can be hard to interpret. But for many patients, they've received a lifetime of transfusions, lots and lots of transfusions. And so over time, it's just more iron than their body can normally deal with. Um, and so ferritin is a way to try to understand, is there iron overload in the body, and do we need to do something about that? Um, if that ferritin is staying up, and usually most people will say about 1,500 or higher, then we start thinking about other evaluations. So you can do special MRIs of the liver um, that can kind of give you a reading or a measurement of how much iron might be in the liver. Um, you can also do a, a liver biopsy, but people generally after transplant, that's not something most people will do. We'll look at the ferritin, perhaps the liver MRI. And then actually the most effective way to deal with that is by drawing lots of blood. <laughs> so after all those years of getting lots of blood transfusions, the best way to deal with it is actually um, to, to take the blood off. There are medicines that can deal with iron overload, but quite frankly, they have lots of other side effects. They can cause rashes and kidney problems, and then we get all confused over what else might be going on. And really the gold standard is this way is just is to draw the extra blood, and it, it helps remove iron. And the reason we care about that is if you get iron overloaded, the iron deposits in your, in your glands, in your thyroid, in your heart, um, in your reproductive glands. And so for someone who's already got a challenge of dealing with hormone problems, we don't want iron overload uh, to factor into that. And so usually if we see the ferritin up, um, and patients are stable after transplant, you can do the phlebotomy or blood drawing, you know, on a monthly basis, and patients tend to tolerate it just fine. Um, 
and it can be very effective monitoring and getting that iron level down. So going forward, as the kids are getting up, we really want to talk to them about, you know, limiting alcohol um, when they're young adults. Um, their body has been through a whole lot more than most people has, has ever been through. And so really want to start those conversations with them. Immunizations are important um, for hepatitis A and B. And it's really important um, to check and make sure that the child has responded to the hepatitis B. Um, it's very common, even in the regular non-transmit population, uh, it's a certain proportion of people who need a booster. And we certainly see that in, in uh, post-chemotherapy and post-transplant patients. Up to a third or more of patients actually need a booster of hep B, even after getting three. Um, and that's such a preventable disease, we definitely want to be screening for that. So, so that's important. All right, metabolic syndrome. Gosh, we are learning so much more about this now. And so it really is kind of having a, a cluster of, of, of issues. So obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, and then cholesterol problems. And we're starting to understand that cranial radiation and probably even total body radiation, TBI, are risk factors for this. Um, and we're also beginning to understand that obesity is, is different in these patients. So it's not, it's not just extra fat, but it's actually the loss of muscle. Um, and there's a funny name for that, sarcopenic obesity. And sarco is just a fancy uh, word for muscle, and penia means decreased. And so it's really a different, different pattern for these patients. And so that is really a huge subject of research right now, and I certainly hope over the next few years we'll understand more about how to monitor best for this and to regulate it. Um, but obviously patients need to have their weight screened yearly, looking at their BMI. Um, if they've had uh, TBI or any abdominal radiation, we do recommend a hemoglobin A1C. That's a way to kind of look at your blood sugar levels over time. So it's certainly very easy to check a blood sugar anytime you have blood drawn, um, but that's giving you just a snapshot. The hemoglobin A1C can give you a several month picture and there's levels so you can start to see, are you creeping into sort of the pre-diabetes phase? Is this becoming a problem? Um, and uh, that's a, a fairly common thing we see, particularly in the teenagers and, and young adults. We're also going to look at cholesterol and lipids and all those things. There's many things that can be done to intervene for that um, because that's very important for the heart healthy. And honestly, just like the whole rest of us, nutrition and exercise are super, are super important um, for our survivors is the same as it is for us. Skin, all right, bottle of sunscreen. Sunscreen, sunscreen, sunscreen is probably the most important thing here. And now there's so many great products, the sun shirts, uh, the hats. Um, I always laugh. I think we struggle the most in the boys. I've never met a boy who liked to put on sunscreen. I almost, I think, prefer a needle poke sometimes rather than lotions and sunscreen. Um, but we really have to talk to them about it and, and, and be vigilant about that. Um, you know, developing skin, skin cancers at some point after transplant is so incredibly common. Um, and, uh, and we really want to focus on that. So it's great, really, for patients uh, to see a dermatologist each year. Certainly, they need to have a full skin exam when they see their survivorship team. But I will tell you, the dermatologists are so astute and so good at picking up just small changes. And that's what this is about, really. Because the skin things, 99.99% .99 of the time, you can easily take care of them. But you've got to find them first. And the dermatologists are so, so good at that. So I think if you're able to see a dermatologist each year, hopefully one at your, at your transplant center. Because, again, they're really in tune with what your child or teenager has been through, and they're going to be have a higher level of suspicion um, for taking a look. So sunscreen, sunscreen, sunscreen. Um, and, of course, no tanning booths. I think they're finally kind of falling out of favor a little bit, but really having that conversation uh, um, with your survivor, no tanning booths. All right, immune system. You know, thankfully, most patients do eventually get that good immune system back. It takes a time, and it's so variable after transplant. That's the hard thing, is it really varies so much from patient to patient. But patients that have chronic GVHD, really, that's the group of patients that have the, the biggest struggle here. And most of those patients have chronic GVHD, it's like they don't have a spleen anymore, even though they've never had the spleen taken out surgically. And so for many of those patients, they stay on penicillin or amoxicillin lifetime. Um, all patients are going to get screened for HIV and hepatitis, and that's true for anyone who's received blood transfusions. That's something we're going to look at. But the biggest thing here is to look at your vaccinations. And this can often be tricky. 
because you're maybe getting vaccinations at home with a regular primary care provider, you've got recommendations from your survivorship team. So one thing you can do to be very proactive about this is every time you come for a survivorship visit, if you're getting your vaccinations at home, get a copy of those records, bring them to them, and that makes it so much easier for everybody to look and see because the catching up is really different after transplant. We have great primary care providers, but it's really a different way to think about it. And sometimes they struggle a bit in understanding all, all, the, different, all the different levels. And so if you can bring a copy with you, that is, that is terrific. People can look at it. You can look at it together and, and figure out what needs to get done there. All right, so cancers after transplant. Thankfully, we don't see too much of this as post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease. Um, that's something that happens much more in patients who get solid organ transplant. So it can happen after bone marrow transplant, but really is overall rare. You can get treatment-related leukemias. It usually happens in the first five to seven years, and still, thankfully, is overall quite rare. It tends to be more this latter group. As we sort of get into 10 and more years post-transplant, um, solid tumors become a possibility, particularly in, in areas where you see radiation. Um, skin cancers, which, again, most of the time can be dealt with quite easily, but you just have to have them found. Looking in the oral cavity, there can be oral cancers, which, again, why it's good to have a dentist who's familiar um, with the things that went on for your child. Um, and so those are all things to think about and know about so that a lump or bump on the body somewhere is going to be a different workup for a survivor than it is for another patient. Okay. Um, so what do we do for screening for that? Of course, a good history and exam, you know, is there anything unusual? Look at looking uh, well at the body, looking at the um, at the oral cavity, the skin exams, and then some special things. So, um, if patients received 20 gray or higher to the breast area, this tends to be the lymphoma patients. They should get a yearly um, mammogram and a breast MRI, and they should start eight um, years after radiation or at age 25, whatever occurs occurs last. Okay, um, and then if patients got high doses to their abdomen there's a screening recommendation for colonoscopy for these patients. Okay. Now, this is probably the most important slide from today. <laughs> and thankfully, it's easy to remember, www.survivorshipguidelines.org. It's a terrific site. It's so much good information. There's so much to take in, and this allows you to read at your own pace and go back and, and answer your questions. So I encourage you to go there. This is done through the Children's Oncology Group, but it's applicable to whatever – you know, condition your child had for transplant. It's got, got great recommendations. And this is, sorry, it's a little bit pale, but this just gives you an idea. So this, you can click on different topics, and they have what's called a help link. And they're often a several-page, you know, handout you can either view online or you can print out. And so this is just an example of, you know, it's a several-page thing talking about dental health after transplant. And they are incredibly well done. Um, so it's a great resource for you. Um, this is another thing that's on the COG website, which is, you know, it says cancer treatment, but it's also meant to apply for, for transplant, essentially, did you get chemotherapy or radiation, okay? And you can see here, it kind of details, you know, what did you get, what were your ages, what were your risk factors? And this is just an example. Hopefully, from your center, you will get something similar to this, you know, a survivorship care plan, um, because one of the biggest challenges we have to do, we have to teach your emerging, growing child, teenager, young adult, they need to know what happened to them. Many times they were young at the time of treatment. They can't say back what happened. You know in great detail, but they need to know that. So hopefully your center will give you something like this. And what I recommend, take a picture of it, okay, because it's a sheet of paper. It's a card. It's a, it may be somewhere at home. May not worry. Everybody has phones now. Take a picture of that. Keep that on your phone. Have your, your child's old enough to have a phone. They can have that, and that's something so easy no matter where you are. If you're in an ER four states away, you can pull that up and say, well, this is, this is what I went through. This is what my child went through. Um, so that's a great tool. And so as we talk about transition, you know, we have responsibility. It's so hard. You guys have been caregivers, which is an incredibly tough job, and it's very easy as caregivers and parents to be so focused on our child that we don't take care of the things for ourselves. So, so model what it is to, to be an adult patient. Make sure that your child sees you, you're going to your doctor's appointments. You're taking care of yourself so they understand how important that is. And take care of yourself. And honestly, some of the most important things I'm talking about today, exercise, good nutrition, avoiding tobacco, 
sunscreen that's good for everyone. So this is really something that is good for the entire family. Um, it's really important. Sometimes it's hard. Your primary care provider may have gone by the wayside when you're in intense treatment. They knew what was going on, but often the, the transplant team or oncology team becomes your primary care provider as well. And that can be a tough time of transition. But, but in order to fully be in survivorship, you've got to have a regular primary care provider. So that's super important. Um, many times your survivorship team can point you in the right direction. You know, most of us do see patients from all over our respective states. And, and over years, we've sort of built relationships. We can say, oh, well, you live here. You need a well, we know we've worked with this group or that group, and they've done a, a great job, so they might be able to help you with that. Um, and often we, um, we recommend, as your child gets older, um, there are providers called MedPeds. So these are essentially primary care providers who have been trained in both internal medicine, which is adults, and pediatrics. And they're often great advocates for our, our, we still call them kids, even when they're young adults, but because they really understand the differences in the pediatric world and the adult world and are great at helping people transition. Um, so that can often be a tremendous benefit. Um, but as you're getting your, your child ready, you want them to be able to answer questions. Well, what was my medical history? What treatment did I get? Um, because, again, many times they were young and they didn't know the details. And do they know... What are the health problems that could happen? Do they know that? So these are, these are the questions that we want to make sure um, that we're asking at the visits. Your survivorship team is hopefully helping ask those. We start quizzing our patients, um, start getting them ready, because we really want them to start taking, uh, taking the reign for their care and understanding what happened to them. All right, so we talked already a little bit about this, about talking with your clinic, your survivorship team. Um, they can many times help you identify. Um, and sometimes now we're seeing this increase more. At your same hospital transplant system, there may be an adult survivorship team that's willing to take our patients as they transition on. Um, that's becoming a little more common, um, and that's terrific if, if it's possible. Um, but if not, it certainly can be done in conjunction with a primary care provider. The survivorship team can give them recommendations about what needs to be done done when. And again, we often find that these MedPeds trained folks are just super terrific at helping um, people who are doing transition. All right. Well, that's all I have for today, but I am super happy to take any questions. And we certainly celebrate being here as survivors. I have a necklace on today that says never, never give up. And this is from one of my transplant patients. And uh, I'll be going to his wedding this fall. Awesome. So... Uh, <laughs> That's what it's all about. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Hutzbitt. That was a really great and interesting topic. Do we have any questions? You know, it's an exciting and kind of overwhelming place to be. You know, it's like all positive things can still cause stress. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's great to be in the survivorship thing, but sometimes it can be hard, too, as you're um, trying to help as your child's maybe getting older and you're trying to learn how, to, how you let go. You've been so involved and doing so many things, how do you, how do you let go and, and get them to be? And so that, that's a process. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question in reference to, um, you talked about the growth hormones. Mm -hmm. How does that work for a patient uh, who or who's obese? Like, are there any complications? Like, what are some um, Yeah, there can be that? some additional complications. Um, in any patients who get growth hormone, there can be some, some joint problems, so they can be more likely to get... Um, some problems where joints kind of pop out of place, mm -hmm. and that's already also an increased risk for an obese patient, um, and so that's something just to, to be aware of. Okay. Um, other patients um, can experience headaches and a few other things, um, but for obese patients, probably the biggest issue would be joint complications. Okay, okay. Any other questions? And the last one for me is, um, as far as survivorship, uh, how long do survivors usually, the survivorship uh, care plan, does it fall, are they followed through, you know, how long, when does yeah. it end, is it forever? Exactly. It's really, it's lifetime. Mm -hmm. It's lifetime. Mm -hmm. And it depends on every um, program. And in my program, we follow patients up until age 30. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we now, though, have a terrific adult survivorship program, mm -hmm. um, so we're maybe starting at age 25. We just we haven't had that piece before, mm -hmm. so we're now starting a little bit earlier at age 25. But what we really do, and I think what's important to understand, because for most people, and I'm going to tell you, we, we do this too, transplanters and oncology teams, we do so much, mm -hmm. right? I've talked about for years, you kind of don't have a primary care provider, and that can be a tough transition. 
But really what the survivorship team is meant to do is not so much to be handing prescriptions out and doing the day-to-day -day management. It's to be screening and identifying and then hoping you with your primary care or specialist handle it. And that's different. And that can be hard, I think, for all of us, both for the providers and for the, the parents and patients, because it's a little bit different care model when it was so intense for so long. But it's so important to get that primary care provider because as, as they get older, it's not going to be so much that we're writing prescriptions and doing these things, but we're going to be making those recommendations for follow-up.